Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today I have a very, very special guest, Pastor Tim Chaddock. He was the pastor at my church, Reality LA in Hollywood, and he preached the sermon on September 20th, 2009, the day I got saved, on Romans chapter 7. And we're going to talk about that day. We're going to talk about how we met, kind of met a week before at that coffee shop. And we're going to get into, get into all of the details of that day. So welcome, Tim Chaddock. Thank you, Beckett Cook. I am delighted to join you on your show. Pastor Tim Chaddock, I should say. Um, now, that's right. I want to get into that day on September 20th, 2009, when you preached the sermon on Romans 7, and even talk about the week before that, where we sort of met at the coffee shop at Intelligentsia. But before we get into all of that, um, tell us a bit about your background, where you grew up, how you came to faith in Christ, et cetera. Yeah. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, in the North Bay. My parents um, both became followers of Jesus in the 70s, and then they moved up there um, where I was born. And though they were Christians and they started a church there when I was very little, um, your dad was a pastor, right? Yeah, yeah, he was the, yeah. the pastor there. And then things kind of, you know, changed as we moved from one part of the North Bay to another. And my my brother and I very much grew up around the kids of our age, our peers, you know, they were not Christians, hardly knew any, I don't ever remember me meeting another like student in the schools I went to that was actually a Christian. Um, if anyone's familiar with the area, it's very secular, it's very non Christian, or as I like to say, they believe in science and crystals in uh, the San Francisco <laughs> Bay Area. Yes. It, was, it was like all the, um, you know, all the hippies after the summer of love left. And then they became my elementary school teachers with like dream catchers in the, you know, yeah. in the classroom and all that. Um, I used to buy drugs, but off of one of my teachers, but that's for a later story. Nice. But um, yeah, so my brother and I, you know, we just, even though we, we had had that awareness of the gospel for my parents, my brother and I were totally unregenerate, hated God. Um, and by the time that I was in my kind of teen years, you know, I started experimenting um, with drugs, started experimenting, you know, sexually and just became very promiscuous at a very young age. I mean, I was like, I was using acid and things like that by the time I was a freshman, which now that I have teenage kids, I'm like, what? <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's, it's nuts. It's insane. But it seemed very normal um, in that context. Like everyone I knew did drug, it wasn't even a thing. Like I said, my teachers did drugs, you know, it was just like a, a normal thing. And the kind of sexual experimentation that was so normal, a, a lot of the kind of cultural issues around sexuality that people started dealing with later in different parts of America seemed so normal, like in the San Francisco yeah. Bay area. And, um, you know, just as the years went on, it just, I went deeper and deeper into that. It got darker and darker and um, just hated God, wanted to have nothing to do with Christianity. Um, but wait, but when you say you hated God, because I mean, you obviously you grew up in a Christian home. Your dad was a pastor. Yeah. What, what led you, I mean, what led you to quote unquote hate God? Yeah, there'd probably be multiple factors there. One of them is my dad became very, very sick. Um, he's uh he passed away over 20 years ago. So he became very, very sick when I was young. Um, my parents experienced a lot of church hurt, church wounds. There was like a nasty church split and all that. So I was very young. I don't remember a lot of the, the details of that. Um, that kind of became a little bit, or at least one excuse of like, man, I, I don't know if I'm into this, this whole thing. Cause I've kind of watched them suffered, even though they themselves like never denied God or never you know, kind of showed any of their own like bitterness or resentment towards God. I resented just the whole situation. And then the other contributing factor was just all the people that I was around, like all my peers, like it right. just had nothing to do with God. It just wasn't even like in the water, you know? So every time I'd like kind of live my life and then I'd, I'd hear these little glimpses from my parents of like Christianity, I'm like, it just seems so out of left field and so irrelevant to me. And knowing that what I was doing was not approved by God is really what made me hate it. Like, I want to have nothing to do with this. Like, he's like a cosmic killjoy. And I'm not. But when you this. were when you were young, did you get like, did you get baptized and stuff? Did that happen? No. Okay. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, I was curious about that. Yeah. Yeah. We were like, you know, we had that good context from my parents, but everything outside of that was just very different for me. The, the school system I was in, the friends I had, teachers I knew, like those were the predominant influences. In and my then, life. and then how in the world out of that context did you come to faith in Christ? <laughs> how old were you, by the way, when this happened? Yeah, I was 19 when I got 19. saved. Um, what's interesting is as my dependence grew on, you know, substance abuse and as, you know, my sexual relationships kind of got a little out of control, I actually started getting pretty depressed um, over it and wanted to clean myself up. Um, There's a few kind of tragic events that happened not to me, but around me. Um, one of my good friends, he took too much acid one night and fell out of a 10 story building in San Francisco and he died. And, you know, there was like these events and these moments that really shook me. And I didn't know what to do with, with that. And I was afraid of going there. I didn't want to deal with, you know, mortality. I didn't want to deal with like the big questions, but the further I kind of got into medicating through just my wild living, the more depressed I got. So there was actually a season before I became a Christian where I tried to become better. I stopped doing the drugs and I only used a lot of alcohol, you know? So in my mind, I was like, Hey, I'm, I'm reforming myself, you know? And I, instead of being very sexually promiscuous, I was just sexually active with one person, you know, it was just those types of things. Like, Hey, I'm, I'm doing pretty good, but I just got more and more depressed. And it was actually through this um, really annoying Christian girl that I had met at this one event who was telling me about this big Christian concert that was upcoming. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm not going to that. That's like so dumb. <laughs> but she had my number and she would call every once in a while, like, Hey, there's this event coming up, you know, in, in April and you should really come. And I'm like, no, not for me. Um, but in my depression, I was getting more and more desperate and I'll never forget the morning of the event. I had gone out the night before I was like drinking tons of alcohol. You know, I stayed up till like four in the morning, got home. I only slept for a few hours and she called me that morning. I'd only had four hours of sleep and she's like, Hey, are you coming to the event? And I woke up and I just said, yes. And I was totally sober. Like, <laughs> I was like, I need to go. And so I drove all the way to San Jose, which from where I lived was like, you know, probably two hours plus. And I got there and I was like, what am I doing? And the event was like cheesy. I didn't like the music. I didn't like anything about it. Um, but man, the preacher came out who was Miles McPherson. Actually, he's um, pastor's church called the rock now down in San Diego. And he just preached the straight up gospel. And I could just feel like I was, I, I, the tears were just wanting to come out and, you know, he's calling sin for what it is, but telling me that Jesus died for all the sin, all this shame that I had, like, uh, I didn't want to come face to face with it, but realizing Jesus took it, like everything changed and I just lost it. And they did like an altar call where they invite the, the new converts to kind of come down to the carpet. And I was probably old. I was 19 and there was all these kids who were like 15 years old next to me. And I'm like sobbing, like ugly cry, snot coming out of my nose. <laughs> and all these kids are looking over at me like, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah, like, that's hilarious. Ah, forgiven, you know, and yeah. And uh, didn't you like I've spend the night at the church that night? You, I did. You didn't want to leave. You just wanted to. I, I didn't want to leave. A, it was really far away from, you know, where I live. That was a long drive. But B, I was like, this is a sacred place. Like, you know, I just want to stay here. And they had like all these people were like going to spend the night there in the gym and they had sleeping bags. And, you know, I had had some clothes in the car. So I literally just like slept in the gym and then woke up the next morning and was just so excited that I could pray to God and I wasn't running away from him anymore. And on my way back home, I called my friends on a pay phone, a few of my close friends. And I was in a band at the time. Music was kind of my life up until that point. I called the band and I quit the band. I was in. <laughs> I was like, I'm not the band. Music anymore. was your life. Meanwhile, you know? there's three electric guitars behind you, which is fun. Yeah. I mean, it's a thing, you know, yeah. I, I wouldn't have had this kind of language for it at the time, but you know, music was my idol. Yeah. Um, I was trying to find my identity in, in music and all that, but man, it was like everything, just the power of those things over me. It was just broken. And yeah. So long story short, a few months of just me trying to navigate through not having any Christian friends. I had heard about this Bible college down in Southern California. Um, it was a Calvary Chapel Bible college. It was really affordable. And on a whim, I was just like, that sounds good. I need to get out of here. 
and but what, I, I but did you did you know that you were you did you feel like a calling to be go into the ministry and to be no you know, like no how, how did you decide to go to a bible college rather than just like whatever like a normal college or i literally just wanted to get out of where i was and out of the like kind of social ecosystem yeah. that i was in because it was it was not good like my early you know kind of months of being a new christian were full of struggle as is the case for a lot of people but i just i didn't have fellowship obviously my parents were you know like amazing but i had like nobody else really so i just needed to get out of there and i thought you know what i can go to this thing i can learn the bible i can kind of wrap my head around like the christian life and that'll be good and it was just a two-year program so that just sounded good i had no aspirations uh, to go into ministry in fact seeing some of the hardships of that from my parents um I was like, man, I, I don't want to do that. I want to follow Jesus, but I don't know if I want to do that. So I was just stoked to have somewhere to go and to learn. And yeah. And so how did I, you, I so what, when did, when, when did the point come where you were like, okay, this is actually a call, a vocation. This is a calling for me. Yeah. The first year of my uh, time at the school was awesome. Just meeting people. I, I met a girl who is now my wife. We've been married for 21 years. We just had our uh, anniversary, which is amazing. She's but amazing, I met her there. The amazing woman and wife, Lindsay. Dude, I love she's her. like, oh my gosh, yes. she is phenomenal. Yeah. She is just, yeah, she's amazing. Um, I met her and, you know, kind of formed a, a friend group and sh she'll tell you that I used to say, I'm never going into to ministry. But as that year went on, I found that people were asking me to lead some teams of projects that they were working on, or people would ask me to speak and I would just be put, I found myself in like leadership positions and <laughs> communication positions. And I was like, oh no. And that's when I started realizing as people were kind of affirming these gifts in me, they're like, oh, maybe you should consider. And I was like, no, <laughs> you know, back, <laughs> like, don't talk to me about that. And as I was reading all these books, I came across um, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who many of your listeners will, will know and love, Martin Lloyd-Jones. Yes. Um, he was a preacher in London, Westminster Chapel, famously did a whole series on Romans that's collected in a series of like 14 books um, that have great cover art, if I may add. <laughs> um, and I was reading um, one of his I was reading one of his Romans commentaries, loved it. He had a book on preaching. I started reading the preaching book and I was like, well, let me just examine this. And it got to a chapter on Romans 10, where he explored the passage when Paul says, how shall they hear without a preacher? And in that moment, I read that verse. It was like the Holy Spirit was like, you're called to preach the gospel. And I was wow. like, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> not me. Yeah, not me. And it was that it was like, okay, this is a thing. And so my second year of Bible college, I'm like, I started leaning into that and it became apparent that I was like, okay, I want to do church work. I want to go to areas that are, you know, kind of in need of the gospel and I want to preach the gospel. So and this is a very, years. very fun fact, but you, your brother happens to be a preacher as well, a pastor as well, right? Which yeah, is kind he, of insane. It's amazing. It's, that you both it's of insane. You are. It's insane for so many reasons. One, he's older than me. Um, but I became a Christian before him. So as he watched my life change, um, he was kind of going through his own, you know, struggles. And eventually within a few years, he gave his life to Christ. And then he ended up going to Bible college and, you know, he ended up, you know, becoming uh, a pastor called into ministry and all that happened right before my dad died. So it was like amazing to, wow. I get emotional just thinking about it. The fact that my my dad saw his two sons kind of put them through hell and just live these horrible lives and then come to faith in Christ. And they're both in the ministry. And then he dies and goes to glory is like, I don't yeah, know. That's exactly just, what happened with me because my, my parent, all of my siblings are, are amazing Christians. And I was the last holdout and my, and, <laughs> and I got, you know, I got saved in 2009 and my parents, my dad and my mom died in, I think 2015 they died six months apart yeah and so it was yeah, so cool that. to see my dad was just so he was just like beaming with joy he's like i remember he mm. told me uh, the last time i saw him he said beckett i am so happy for you i am so happy for you and it was just like i'm so glad we had that moment before you died you know that that yeah, you know i wasn't totally. still the prodigal like being crazy in la yeah. 
Yeah. I'm so grateful for that. And my mom is, you know, she's 79. She's amazing. And she's just like, oh, she's like a spiritual legend. And yeah, just (laughs) just makes me so happy. And my brother and I are just doing this whole thing. And God just brought redemption in our family. And then how did it, how did Reality LA come about? Because you were, yeah, I think you and a couple and Nick Tortorici, maybe I, I can't remember the details, but how did you end up planting Reality Los Angeles, the church where I go to and where I got saved? Yeah, I was working after Bible college. I started working at a church in Orange County, California called Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. Um, the pastor, Brian Broderson there, he like met me at Bible college and kind of took a chance on me and gave me a job. And I ended up becoming an intern pastor and eventually got ordained. So I worked there for about four years. And during that time, I met a guy named Britt Merrick, who um, started a college ministry in Santa Barbara, California called Reality. And God just did such a tremendous work like through that ministry and seeing all these young people like coming to faith and growing in their faith. Um, to the point where Britt knew he needed to start like a church and even the church he was working for at the time is like, Hey, you need to go start a church. Like God is doing something. And so he did. And that's called reality Carpinteria. And it started in 2003, but right before, and then during that time, I met him doing some guests preaching together at like a youth camp, I think it was. And we just became instant friends. Like to this day, he's one of my closest and dearest friends. And I saw what he was doing and I would go up to visit him in Santa Barbara. And what I loved about the reality ministry was this beautiful blend of like full on preaching, you know, holding nothing back and even going quite a long time and preaching, but then this invitation to respond and worship and communion and prayer without kind of rushing on to the next thing. Um, There was this, you know, something that we often associate with maybe going on a retreat or a camp where yeah. you have unhurried time to not just hear the word of God, but actually respond to the word of God. Um, and this is no criticism to any other liturgy or model at all whatsoever. Um, I just resonated with that. That's kind of how they structured the, the service. And I was like, man, I just love this, the whole philosophy. And I just thought if I'm going to plan a church, I want it to be a reality. I, I want to like join him and I want to do it like this. And so in 2004, he said, hey, well, let's talk more about this. Like, where would you want to plant? And I said, well, maybe San Francisco, because obviously being from the Bay Area, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go there. I'm going to preach. And he's like, what about L.A.? And (laughs) I was like, like, what? I (laughs) hate L.A. Because anyone knows if they're from the San Francisco Bay Area, you like have to hate la like it's just a thing it's a part of your like bay area people in los angeles don't even don't even have that that animus towards san francisco because we don't think about san francisco but that's yeah yeah it's hilarious and i was like no (laughs) but he's like he's like just pray about it he did that little like jedi kind of you know just pray about it (laughs) that's funny um and so my wife and i did and we prayed about it for like eight months and just through a lot of you know kind of a variety of ways in which God was just giving us confirmation. It became very clear that yes, we're supposed to join reality and yes, it is LA. And we started making that hour drive up to just kind of pray and explore and started meeting people. And that's when I met Nick Tortorici, who you interviewed um, a while back. And he was like, you're going to plant in LA. Like, are you kidding me? And I was like, yeah, like, (laughs) but I was like, dude, I don't think I have some kind of, you know, secret formula or anything like you know we weren't trying to be arrogant like we just knew that god was calling us to do it and he heard that i was going to get sent out from this church called reality carpenteria and so nick and his wife started driving up there we moved there for a year to do prayer meetings before we moved to la which was amazing and so we eventually um planted towards the end of 2005 um, with a handful of people including the nick uh, Nick and Heidi Tortorici and like probably a dozen or so people. And uh, we would be stoked if we just had like 30 people in a room that we could like preach the gospel to. That was our. Uh, yeah. Was and our it standard. went from 30 people to 3000 at one point, but yeah, it, it's, and not, it's not about the numbers, but it, that's just, it's just what's interesting God about God was that, doing something. Well, God yeah. was doing something, but, but what's interesting too is, is there was an, there was a hunger, I, you know, you could, I could feel it in LA a hunger for the truth. And people were, I mean, it's still the case. Like people are tired of postmodern, postmodernism and just not knowing what's true or not. And so I think 
reality being in, it's literally in this part of Holly, it's on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And well, it was at the Michael Jackson Auditorium in the, at that school, the elementary school first, yeah. and then it moved to a high school. But we actually uh, went to junior high in between. Oh, you did. Okay. Started at Gardner Street Elementary, and then we went to junior high for a year, and then we ended up at the high school where the church is still today. So, yeah. So, uh, I think, yeah, it's a testament to God just moving in his grace and also just the, the hunger for truth in the city because it's, there's, it's just lies. The city is full of lies. <laughs> the Truth About Lies, which is a book you wrote. Uh, you guys should read it. Okay, so, and then how, so from, so 2005, was the church growing kind of steadily or how did that work? So the first year that we planted the church, it stayed, you know, relatively like small-ish. Um, it grew a little bit, but the turning point came when there was this like USC student you know, group that would start oh, kind of right. coming, you know, from downtown um, over to the church. And there was like a couple of young people who just like were on fire for the Lord's like love Jesus. And they started bringing all their like non-Christian friends. And one of them uh, actually got into an accident, a skateboarding accident and went into a coma and he was in a coma for months and he eventually died. But through that time, all of his friends, he was just one of those guys that had tons of favor just with people in general, he was like, just yeah. well known and well spoken of and well respected. And, you know, didn't hold back on his testimony about Jesus, but like serve people it was amazing. So during that time, when he was in his coma, like all his non Christian friends and other students from like USC and their friends who had graduated and were working in like the industry, they all knew him and they were really concerned. And they had questions about life. And, you know, it's kind of a tragic thing, you know, to happen to someone so young where they've got all their life ahead of them. So they started coming to church. And I literally remember it was like in a matter of weeks, we went from having like 50, 60, 70 people. And all of a sudden it was like, during this time, it was like a hundred people, 120 people, 150 people. And at his memorial service, there was like tons of people there. And it's just this testimony to his faith in Jesus. And, you know, that's where his hope was. And this, the, the message of the gospel went out. And it's like, it just didn't stop. Like all these young people just like started coming and that kind of opened the door to other people and the growth just kind of kept happening. And I love sharing this because it has nothing to do with us. My sermons were terrible. Like the music <laughs> wasn't good. It was hot in there. There was no AC. Like there was nothing, you know, like appealing about it. Like we, we didn't have this like, you know, great production or whatever. Like I would just kind of work my way through these sermons and like, next thing I know we'd have our time of like worship and response and like the carpet area in front of the communion elements was just filled with young people, like crying and calling out to Jesus and going up to get prayer. And we're like, Whoa, something is happening here. And it has nothing to do with what we're doing, you know, in the sense of well, like formula. The gospel, preaching the gospel model. is powerful. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was the gospel is the power <laughs> yeah. of just the message of Christ and, and, you know, preaching from scripture and, inviting yeah. the Holy spirit to move. Like what was the first yeah. book you preached out? Was it John? Yeah. It was the gospel of John. Yeah. And so, okay. So let's get to that day. Let's well, get let's, to get you. To the, <laughs> let's get to the day that we quote unquote met. Cause I mean, we probably have different memories of that day and well, you could tell me what you remember, but this is what I, I remember. So we, I was at intelligentsia, which is a coffee shop in silver Lake, which is on the East side of LA. And I was with my best friend at the time. And um, I don't know if, I don't remember seeing you inside because the, the, there's an inside part and then there's this big kind of patio outside. Um, and, it's, and it's a very crowded place and it was very popular back in the day. It, it may was. still be. Um, and I remember sitting at, outside at a table with my best friend and I saw you come out with a to-go cup of, of coffee. And uh, I saw in, in, your, in one of your hands was a, a Romans, con it was a comic, it was a giant book with the words, with the word Romans on the spine. Yep. And I knew enough about, I say this all the time, I knew enough about kind of religion as it were, uh, that that was, I knew that it was a religious book and I knew that it was a Christian book. And I, I didn't know if it was, I didn't know if it was a, I didn't know if it was a commentary, I guess, but 
And so I saw that and that, that was my first kind of like, wow, like this is weird. And it was, it was quite a, quite a shock to me. And, and my friend saw it too. And we were just like, whoa. So, but tell me what, what was your memory of that first kind of moment? Well, pretty close. I think I was, they have a bar inside of the, the cafe <laughs> and I was sitting there with my laptop as was my tradition. And I have all my books stacked and uh, the, the common Terry, what you're referring to is actually Douglas Moo's commentary. If you want that little yes. fun fact, massive. And it says like Romans, you know, right on the, the spine. It's huge. So I had my stack of books and you and your, your friend were sitting there at the bar, like on the corner. And so you saw my books and I was getting ready to leave. And you're like, Romans, like, what's that? You know? And I was like, I said oh, that out loud. Yeah. Oh, okay. and I was like, oh, I was getting ready to leave. So I think that's where you were thinking of like, when I was on my way out, it's like, oh yeah. You know, they're, they're like, it's this, you know, it's in the Bible, like a new Testament letter. And like, I'm a pastor and I'm a preacher. And you're like, what, like, what, is, what is this? What's happening? And, and then that led to the people who were sitting in the patio area who were a part of my church, who then you were introduced to. And then you guys had a conversation that went on after I, after I left, that's my. And what, but what was my, re so was my reaction was I nervous laughter? Was I, I was what I remember. Laughter. So I wasn't like mocking you. You're like, just, what? Oh, well, like, there maybe just a little bit of condescension about? there. Yeah, I was like, what? What, what is this? Like, oh, I see, I don't remember what? the inside part. I just remember, I thought it was outside, but maybe I got it. I, I was getting it. ready to leave. I Because I remember I had my laptop and I had the books like stacked right next to him. And that's how you saw like on the, the spine. It was It was a very big advertisement for, you know, studying the book of Romans that I carried with me. Yeah. And then I remember you coming out and you went over to the table where there were young people with Bibles on the table and you kind of greeted them and, you know, you guys were very friendly. So I was like, oh, they must be at the same, in the same cult. <laughs> they must be at the same church. Um, and so, and then you left. And then I, uh, I ended up, as you said, talking to these, these people for a while for, I think it was like, it went on for a couple hours, but, uh, and then of course they, I was invited to come to reality LA the following Sunday. And so did, were you, were you, I mean, were like the following Sunday, were you aware that I was in the auditorium? I was not aware that you were in the auditorium, but I was aware that uh, you and you were invited okay. that weekend Yeah, um, because I did hear back from that group of people. They're like, oh yeah, like, oh yeah, that guy that I met, he was like subtly kind of low-key weirded out by my like Romans commentary. <laughs> you guys like have this conversation and it went on for a long time. Like we invited him to, to church this weekend and I think he might come. And so I wasn't sure that you were there, but I did know that you were invited because I had spoken with that, that crew. Okay. <laughs> and then, so what happened? And then you preached on Romans seven. Now, now Romans, the passage you preached on was Romans seven verses 13 through 25, which is one of the most disputed and controversial passages in the Bible. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so tell us what, just remind the, our, the audience what that passage is about. Uh, you don't have to, we don't have to get into the exegesis of it because we could go, the I weeds. Mean, there's, there's been sure. debates on it for millennia or centuries. Yeah. The, the basic gist is, well, first of all, at that time, when you came to church, our bread and butter for reality LA is to teach through books of the Bible. And we had gone through the gospel of John. Then we went through the new Testament book of James. And then we decided to do Romans and we ended up at, in Romans for two and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> it's would like, like, it's never, I think one of your sermons was like one verse, like it, it, sometimes you would have a sermon on one verse. Yeah. It's all the stuff you're like, not supposed to do when you're planning a church, you know, like do hour long sermons in Hollywood. Like, yeah. Especially yeah. in Hollywood. You're not supposed to do that. Yeah. So we're going through Romans and, um, you came in, in the middle of that. And it's a section where Paul is basically explaining the relationship between the law and sin, which then raises the issue of the relationship between sin and ourselves. So it's both very theological, but it's also very personal. So the chapter in question that we were going through, um, we were teaching it in a series of three called the war inside. And right. it was really a, taking our cue from what Paul's talking about is like, Hey, when you're, when you're not a, a Christian, 
you're not even aware. You might be aware that like something's wrong with the world, but you can't quite put your finger on it until you have the clarity of the law of God, which really reveals sin for, for what it is. And that sermon on that, that day, um, it was called the unwinnable war. And my whole point was like this, this thing called sin, even if you recognize it, you're not really going to see it for what it is. You're not going to be able to suppress it. And because I love alliteration, you're not going to be able to slay it. <laughs> slay. I get my third S in there. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And it was like, you know, Paul is there and he's saying like, man, I, I wasn't really aware of what sin was until the law came and it was like a mirror and it just revealed how bad it was. But then also my inability to fight against it because it's part of me. The phrase that the theologians use is indwelling sin. Right. And it just for Which, people, it, the, the mo, kind of the famous verse from that passage, if you'll, you'll remember, is when Paul says, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. So it's that kind yeah. of tension. That, and the thing that I hate, that's the thing that I end up doing. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Like who can, you know, who can save me from this? You know, only and, Jesus Christ. And so, and just, just to be kind of clarify. So if people were, are wondering what we're talking, what I was talking about. The debate. Two, yeah, the debate. I mean, one, the, uh, some, some believe, and Augustine changed his mind on this and he went with this, the, the one I'm about to say, but uh, some believe that theologians believe that Paul is speaking in this passage about him himself as a regenerate person so as a christian while others think that paul is is still under the law as a jew and, and not speaking as a christian so yeah. uh that's just the the debate but we won't get into that well and the reason why that's important aside from the debate is paul speaking as you know kind of um, the present struggle of a Christian and how a Christian relates to the sin nature, or is he kind of going back in time as it were to his like old self trying to find his righteousness in Judaism. What's interesting about the whole passage is even though he's teaching this very important theological theme, he does it with very personal terms. And that I think is like one of the headlines of, of Romans seven. And that's why it's so powerful to preach because he makes it very personal a conversation about the law of God and the relationship to sin and how it reveals, he uses that first person testimony, whether he's kind of, you know, going back and kind of, you know, um, pretending to be his old self to demonstrate how the law works in relation to sin, or whether it describes the present relationship is something that Christians can debate. And that's fine. But I just love how personal he yeah. uses it. Because when you hear that phrase, like that, which I know I should be doing, I don't. And that, which, you know, I don't want to do, that's the thing I'm doing. Like, ah, yeah. you know, like I, mean, but, and, I, I can't save myself. Yeah. And if, uh, I mean, there's other passages in the Bible that speak to that as, you know, as the struggle of the Christian life. Uh, but yeah. So, and what's, what's funny, I'll, I'll tell this quick, funny story is that <laughs> when I was in seminary in, in my hermeneutics class, my professor, we actually did a study on this very passage in Romans 7. And we kind of, it, it took us a week to do kind of this, the study. And then at the end of the week, every, we went around, the professor went around to everyone and said, okay, where do you land on this? <clears throat> and some people said, oh, Paul is unregenerate. Others said Paul's regenerate. And, and at the end of it, I said, so professor Shin, where do you stand on this? And he said, Paul's unregenerate. So he 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 believes that Paul wasn't a Christian when he's speaking in this passage, and I so I said, wait, so but I got saved on this passage. So does that mean that I'm not really saved? <laughs> and everyone laughed, and it was funny. Um, so okay, so did you now during the service? Obviously, I, what's so interesting about Romans seven is it's kind of, in a way it's kind of a random passage to get saved under for me. I, for, it just seems like a, just cause it's kind of an obscure passage. Right. And it's a very yeah. difficult passage to understand. Yeah. It's very technical, it's very technical. And so um, that's, what's fascinating is that you preached on this passage and that's the day. I mean, and, and, I, and I, as I say all the time, I'm telling you like the second you started speaking, I don't know what, mm. I mean, it was the Holy spirit, but I was literally on the edge of my seat like leaning forward mm -hmm. and I was riveted to the sermon and 
I remember I say this all the time, but every sentence you were saying, I was like, what? This is true. And it, everything you were saying was resonating as truth in my mind and my, my heart. And <clears throat> I didn't know why. I just was like, and mm. I re- your, your sermons were famously an hour long. And they, but I didn't want you to stop speaking. I just was like, please just keep talking. Like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Don't leave the stage. Like, what are you talking about? And, um, and so, and then after you finished the sermon, I, you, there's a time of response, right? And so there's people on the prayer ministry on the sides. And that was another kind of moment. I was like, should I go over there and get prayed for? Cause you said, you know, there's people on the side. If you need prayer for anything, they can pray for you. And I went over and got prayed for by Nathan Potter, whom I'm going to have on the show soon in, in a few couple of weeks. But, um, but he, I just, he prayed for me. And I remember thinking like, what, why, why, why does this random straight dude care about me so much? Like, it, cause his prayer was so full of like kind of love and concern for me. And, and it was just, mm. it was weird. It was so touching and moving. And anyway, I go back to my seat after the prayer and there's still 25 minutes left of worship music. So there, there was a long kind of response time after the sermon, like 30 minutes. And that's when I, that's when it all went down. That's when the Holy Spirit just like, <laughs> like crashed into me and God revealed himself to me. And I was doubled over in tears, bawling like you were when you were 19, bawling for the next, for the rest of the service. And, um, but my question to you is, were you aware? Did you like, were you aware of that? Did you see me crying or were you like, did you, or were you completely unaware of that? I was unaware of that until you told me like a week later. Okay, I okay. actually even went through um, some of our old email exchanges the other day that date all the way back to 2009. Oh my gosh, I love it. They're hilarious uh, for a lot of reasons. But yeah, you were kind of like, you know, telling me not only what happened, but then you were telling me how your friends reacted when you told them you were a Christian. It's like, it's, it, was, it was great to look back over those emails. But on the day, I was not aware. And one of the beautiful things about how God saved you um, is that it was just in the ordinary like Sunday gathering of Christians. You know, it it wasn't like we had a bring a friend to church day or like an evangelistic Sunday. And those things are great. Those things are fine. But this was just a very ordinary, you know, church service. Um, But something that was drilled in to me by the people who've invested in my life, but also just a personal conviction I have is that the bread and butter of the church should be just like going through the, the Bible, teaching it. I don't ever want to do a bait and switch thing where we kind of do one thing, you know, we're kind of like shrouding or shielding people from like the meteor stuff. And then they can find out about that later. Like, I just want to kind of be upfront. And that's what we try to do by just going through, Hey, wherever the passage takes you, that's what you're going to preach. Romans one sexuality. Here we go. Uh, Romans two, like whatever, just whatever the text is saying, let's just go there. But the other part is, this is kind of just my own, even how I got saved is I'm always mindful that there's just a lot of people in a room. There's people who are mature, Jesus loving Christians who need to grow in their faith, as well as the man or woman at the back who's just got their arms folded and they're like, what's this all about? And so just with urgency, addressing those people in the room and trying to like show the the relevance of like what this is to everyone. Like if you're not a Christian, you need to think about this. If you are a Christian, you need to think about this. And and what I love is this, that passage that you heard, it's just like, Hey, God reveals what sin really is. You can't fight it. And I think the basic gist of the sermon ending was like, you can't trust in a savior if you don't think you need to be saved. But this is saying like, none of us can save ourselves. You cannot save yourself. Nothing in this world can save yourself. Jesus can save yourself. And I, I just think the gospel should be preached like every yeah, that's single what it, time. You, that's every what single you, theme. You're really good at weaving the gospel through every sermon. And it's and what I, I listened to the sermon, I listened to that sermon, which we'll put underneath in the notes, but I listened to that sermon uh the other night. And what's what what's interesting about it, what stood out to me is you said the word, and this is like very unpopular, you know, in church today, but you said the word sin. 
I think a hundred times in that sermon. And I mean, the passage like kind of forces you to say that, but, but you said sin so many times. And then you kept saying, you need us. We need a savior. We need a savior. We need a savior. And, and I think that's what really struck me was because I, after living in LA since 1993, uh, and even before that, and, you know, I, I never even thought about sin, really. I didn't even, sin wasn't even on my radar at all. And so the fact that you just kept saying sin, 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 and then, and then at the end, you were like, we need a savior. This is why we need a savior. And I was like, what? Like, this is all making sense. And, and as I always say, it was the first time in my life that I had actually heard the gospel and understood it and uh that's mm. that's what was so profound about it um but yeah i well, remember the, <laughs> you use the 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 sin word many many times the, the s word the s word you know I, there's this old phrase i love this phrase um i think it was like a puritan writer who said it but we preach to the ear but the spirit preaches to the heart talking about the act of preaching. Yeah. And I love that phrase because as, as a preacher or just a Christian who's sharing, like we're called to share and God uses us and our opportunities and our personalities, whatever, but we're not the ones that do the work, right? It's not the sermon that saves you. It's Jesus that saves you. And you heard about Jesus through the sermon and the Holy spirit illuminates that to your heart. And you're like, you know, aware of your, your sin. And even as you're telling me that what's interesting is I would imagine some people hearing what you just said about the word sin being spoken of so many times. And often people might respond by saying, well, that's just a Bible bashing, you know, fire and brimstone sermon, which if you only talk about sin and that's it, then that would be one thing. But if you talk about sin and then what Jesus has done about sin and how sinners could be saved and accepted and adopted and forgiven forever by God, then you're preaching the gospel. And I think what's sad is a lot of people feel like, oh, I can't talk about sin because then it's going to come across as if I'm like a Bible thumping fire and brimstone, you know, like preacher. And it's like, well, only if you don't preach grace, Yeah. but then they won't appreciate grace if you don't talk about sin. Yeah. You know, there's you the kind of televangelists sin, we are don't, famous. We don't know why we need a savior. And that's what you did. And, and you also. Yeah, exactly. And that's literally the point of that whole sermon. Yeah. And one of the other things you talked about that really struck me was how Paul was trusting in his own moral, <clears throat> his own moral effort. And yeah, for me, that just from my childhood kind of experiences and stuff that really flipped everything I thought religion was on its head. And I was like, and I, I, mean, I remember I say this all yeah. the time too. I was like, this is the gospel. Like this is good news. Like that other stuff was bad news. This is good news. Mm -hmm. Like the whole idea that you can kind of earn your way to salvation and like, who knows if you're going to go to heaven or not, but you've just got to do as, as well as you can. And that, I mean, that's like the most burdensome. That's terrible news. That's not good news. Totally. And, and Romans seven is what Paul's describing his journey there of like, man, like when I tried to do the law, like on the outside, it looked like I was doing great. But then the law says, thou shalt not covet. And I was like, oh, shoot. Well, I covet. And that's like a desire. Like, where did that come from? Oh, no, I guess sin is in my nature. So it's like, he's like, I can't make myself righteous and no one can. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's so ironic, tragically ironic, that oftentimes people preach the law without preaching the gospel. Um, I think Graham Goldsworthy, great author, calls it evangelical Judaism, to where right. they may be ex you know, kind of like teaching a particular passage, you know, from the law, but they're not actually showing the fulfillment in Christ and the inability of human beings to fulfill the law. They're just saying, here's the law of God. This is what God wants. Now go do it. Let's pray. Yeah. He says, that's not a Christian sermon. That's moralism. That's yeah. not a Christian sermon. That is moralism. That is legalism. But if you're like, here's what the law says, you need to do this. Oh no, you can't. The problem is because of sin. That means you need a savior. God sent his son. The law was our guardian, as Paul said, to kind of point us to Christ. It's like the mirror that reveals the sin in us, but we don't take the mirror off the wall to try to clean ourselves. It points us to Jesus. He's the solution. Trust in him. You're given a new heart, which then he goes on to in the rest of, of Romans. And you live out of this new identity 
in Christ. Like, man, just, we need to preach the gospel. That's right. Amen. And yeah, I remember you, you said something to the effect of we, we see how deep sin goes and how great the grace of God in Christ is. Uh, so yeah, it was like sin and grace. You, you did both. Yeah. So what's interesting about this whole story is just, we never know who we're affecting. You know, you mm -hmm. walked into the coffee shop with your re religious books, quote unquote, and you never know how, what impact that's going to have on a person, like the, the people at the, co at the table with Bibles on the table. And it's kind of a shame because I don't really carry my Bible around anymore because of this thing, the phone. And so, but this is such a great prop that to start conversations, you know, and so you never, you know, we never really know how we're going to be affecting people, mm -hmm. you know, when we're out in the world, out in public. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of one of the, uh, the lessons from this is, is, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. And when I, when I was thinking about your story and how God saved you, the three things that stood out to me as I was reflecting on it this week, number one, the fact that you got saved and you become <laughs> such a good friend. I'm like, yay. <laughs> number two, the fact that you got saved in just a very ordinary I mean, nothing's ordinary about church because God is at work, but you know what I mean? There, it wasn't like a special Sunday. It wasn't like a special message. It was just working through the Bible. Like it was just amazing that you got saved just kind of on that because that set your expectation as to what church was, was like and what it was going to be like if you were going to choose to follow Jesus. Like, this is what you get. This is kind of the, the thing. We don't do like some other thing and then introduce you to something else later. But the third thing that stands out is what you just mentioned is that a lot of people played a part in you coming to faith. Ultimately, Jesus is the one yeah. that saves, but Jesus has chosen to use his body. It's why we're called to evangelism. And I often think about it, especially your story. Um, and this should be an encouragement to like any Christian and every church. I think of evangelism like an ecosystem. Every part in an ecosystem is very important. One might be more or less visibly prominent, but just like in a, a, an, a real ecosystem, if you take a certain element out, you realize that, oh, it impacts the whole thing. And what I love about the story is there were people who were praying for you before you came to faith, you know, yeah. many, many years. There was like, there's me, I'm kind of meeting you. I happen to be the preacher, but then you meet this, this group of other people and they're talking about Jesus and then they, you know, kind of invite you to church and then you go to church and then you go and pray with Nathan Potter and he prays over you. <laughs> and then you meet people in the courtyard and then you like send an email, you know, it's like, it's this whole ecosystem. Like Paul says, you know, in talking about, you know, the work of ministry, he's like, some people plant, you know, other people water, but God is the one that gives the increase. And I love this story because I really think it's just an example of that. So I don't want any Christian to get discouraged because they don't have these like, you know, Billy Graham level, like skills. It's like, whatever, you're just to be faithful with what you have and the gifts God has given you and the opportunities he's put before you. And he uses all of us together, like this evangelistic ecosystem. And I just love that. Well, speaking of evangelism, let's end on this. I mean, you kind of talked about the gospel, but if, if, a, if a non-believer is watching this or listening to this, can you just give them a great gospel presentation right now? Well, the gospel's great. So I don't know if the presentation will be, but here's, as I was thinking, you know, we've been talking about this passage in Romans seven and Paul is becoming aware as he looks at the perfect law of God, it's like God's perfect standard, a reflection of his character, what he's intended for us, what he's intended for the world, um, most specifically revealed in the 10 commandments. And Paul's whole point is if you look at those commandments and you're honest, we've all fallen short whether in motive or in deed, like we cannot live up to that standard. And because we've sinned and that word just means any attitude or action that goes against God, rebels against God and puts something else in his place because we've all sinned. We're under the condemnation of the law. We are under the judgment of a holy God. Sin leads to separation from God and it's terminal. It lasts for eternity unless there's a, a remedy. So the point of Christianity is not like, Hey, be good and try not to sin. Or like, here's the rules that, that you can follow. There are rules. There is a standard God's perfect standard, but the point in communicating that and sharing that with people 
is to show that we have failed and that we cannot save ourselves. And the other thing that stands out about Romans 7, especially in our culture, is that Paul doesn't look within to find the answer. You know, right now in our culture, we're told, like, if you can just find your true self, if I can just dig deep enough into my heart, like, then if I just follow what my heart tells me, then I'll be free. Like, that's the secular narrative, yeah. right? You talk about it all the time on the show. That's the narrative. Oh, so people move to LA and like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm just going to like go on a spiritual retreat and like find myself <laughs> and then I will be saved. And Paul is like, hey, I've been on that retreat and it only leads to condemnation. He's like, man, when I looked in my heart, he's like, oh no, like I, I can't deal with this. It's a part of my, it's a part of my nature. So yeah. Looking out to some external standard to save you won't happen. Looking in will not happen. You need to look up. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live the life that we never could live and die the death we should have died by dying on a cross, paying the penalty that our sin deserves so that we could have the life that he deserves. He's a substitute. He put himself in your place, in my place. And the message that I heard back at the message that, that you heard on that day is that you should pay this price because of your sin, but God sent his son, Jesus to stand in your place and to take that, that hit for you so that you can be forgiven. So all that's necessary is for you to receive that gift. So if you are, you know, listening to this, like, and you're thinking, man, what do, what do I need to do? You need to trust in Jesus. He's the son of God who came into the world to save sinner me and you. It's not about trying to go to some like rehab, spiritual rehab center, or trying to do some good deeds to like, try to compensate for your bad deeds, or to kind of like look within to find your true authentic self. Like we're all in sin and only Jesus can save. He's the only one that's going to free you from a guilty conscience, restore you in a relationship with God. And, and in that it's beautiful. You're like adopted by God and you know, you have a purpose here and now, and you'll be with him forever and eternity and all the yeah, sad you have things eternal in life, life come which untrue. is a bit, kind of a big it's deal, like, right? Yeah. You have the greatest purpose in like the universe that no matter what job you have or like community you're in or city that or village that you, you live in, you have this eternal purpose that no one, not even the devil himself or the failures of man can ever take away from you. And I'm like, who does that is the best news. It's literally the best news. So the question is not why the question is like, why not? Like, right. Why? This is like all the answers of the longings of the heart are found in Jesus Christ. It's true. Trust it's him. so true. I mean, it was such a relief, as I always say, when, um, when I met Jesus that day and I uh, was uh, saved that day because I, it was just the, the, the burden of not knowing where I came from, what I'm doing here and where I'm going was so heavy. And that yeah. burden was just like, boom, it just like lifted off of me. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I know the meaning of life now. Yeah, so that was that was the most I mean, it's crazy. It's like you, you people search for the meaning of life their whole lives. And it's yeah. all it's found in Christ. It really is like, that's just yeah. that's it. That's the meaning of life. Yeah. Even though it's it's, you know, not widely known amongst popular culture, the classic pilgrims progress is, you know, this, this story from hundreds of years ago of like this, you know, his, his name is the main character, the protagonist, if you will, his name's Christian. He goes on this journey through life, but it, it's all like a metaphor, kind of an allegory of the Christian life, but he's just carrying this burden. And yeah. I remember when I saw the little map of that, if anyone wants to Google it, it's great. He's just got, he's like carrying this huge sack and, you know, it's not until he like, you know, he gets to the wicked gate the gospel. and it falls off, I think. Yeah. yeah. And the weight falls off. And it's mm -hmm. like that, image is just timeless and it's timeless for a reason because whether you lived in the 1500s or 2022 like we all you know even the, the greatest philosophers that people rave about you know even Nietzsche talked about this invisible burden that's there like a dark stranger but he didn't have an answer for it and Jesus does like that burden that you feel is is not the weight just of the world or just like a few mistakes here and there or like you just need to do like a a detox this month like it is the burden of sin and it can only be removed in Christ Amen. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Pilgrim's Progress, I think, is the best-selling book in English next to the Bible. Uh, and it's for John Bunyan wrote it, and uh, mm -hmm. and it's 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 a best-selling book for a very big reason because it's amazing. It's like I, I I always recommend it. I've read it many times. Um, well, I think that's it. Thank you, Tim Chaddock, for. Oh, by the way, where? So where are you now? Because you you. Explain what happened. You, you moved to London Explain and now you're back yourself. in California. <laughs> 
yeah, we, so after 10 years of being in LA, we felt like God was leading us to take a step of faith. And even though um, Reality LA was thriving at, at the time, we felt that God was calling us to kind of basically sell everything we have. That's almost literal and move to London to start a church, which we did in 2015. We started Reality Church to London. We moved there and we lived there for five years. Um, I've you know, my, my wife and I, as I said earlier, have been married for 21 years, but we have three daughters who are now 18, 15, and 10. Um, so we served there, started the church there. And after five years, I believe God was calling us back to California. Um, a great pastor named Bijan Mirtaloui, um, and his wife came to take over Reality Church London, and they're leading that church now, and it's thriving in London. It's amazing. And then we came to Reality Ventura, so just an hour north of Los Angeles, um, this church has been in existence for over 12 years, and it was started by uh, the original reality um, with Britt Merrick, um, and they were looking for a teaching pastor and praying for a teaching pastor, and it just seemed to be the right fit. We knew God was calling us back. So uh, I'm in Ventura at Reality Ventura, and I'm the pastor for On preaching the beach. and vision. Yeah. Even though I'm not like a beach guy, as you probably know, <laughs> like it's nice. Yeah. You know, I, I like the coast, but I'm not like a beach guy. You yeah. Know? So, Yeah. Well, awesome. Uh, thank you for being on the show, Tim Chaddock. And thank you for preaching the sermon that I got saved under. Praise God. Praise, Praise God, God is right. <laughs>